Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special presentation of SuperCloud 4, our focus on generative AI. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We are here in beautiful Cary, North Carolina at the SAS Studios, an impressive studios. I'm here with Reggie Townsend, Vice President of Data Ethics with SAS, CUBE alumni. Reggie, thanks for spending the time with me today. Thanks for having me. First of all, this is an amazing studio you guys have here, an amazing campus uh, yeah. here at SAS. The team does a tremendous job, uh, so thank you for that. So I want to pick up our conversation we had at uh, SAS Explore at the ARIA a few weeks ago, um, where AI and AI ethics is what you do. It's been the center of the conversation um, for the whole year, and even now with the hype cycle still ratcheting up fast and hard, the substance is matching the hype and the industry is leaning into as part of the whole program at Explore, but it's, it's gone beyond the, the in tech industry. It's, it's hit the living rooms of every home out there. It's in the world and everyone's talking about AI. Is AI going to be good? Is it going to be bad? What's the role of the government? What's the private public partnership? We teased a little bit out at Explore in our conversation there, but it's getting bigger and DC has been doing a lot of discussions around how do you regulate it or not? What's the role of tech? There's some that you're leading here at SAS. What's, uh, What's the current status post Explore? What have you been working on? Post Explore, what have I been working on? So, um, making sure that we get ourselves in a good position to deal with some generative of our own, not just the things that we're um, kind of creating, but the things that we are also looking to consume, quite frankly. Uh, putting the right policies in place, we hope. Um, just like a lot of folks, right? We're, we're all. Um, experiencing this together for the first time, right? And um, in the absence of you know, strict regulation, which some could argue is, is a good thing, um, others would argue, of course, not, depending on kind of where you are on the globe. Um, in the absence of that, you've got to put um, good policy and practices in place for your organizations to ensure that your organizations are um, not just leveraging the the upside of the capabilities, but also mitigating some of the potential liabilities and risk associated with that. And so trying to strike the right balance is what we've been up to. And you guys had a great uh, keynote on that. Uh, before I get into some of the questions around how you see things and the role of SAS and, and the role of the new role that you're in, what is your job? I mean, take a minute <laughs> to explain uh, what your role is as, as Vice President of Data Ethics. What does it entail? Yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of outreach that you're doing with, with government and then trying to put these guardrails in place as, as they figure that out. But what is your day-to-day your -day role here? Yeah, so my day-to-day, -day, I have responsible innovation for the company effectively. Uh, from a data ethics perspective, that entails all things, you know, data and how it uses, how it gets used. I like to say just as a matter of shorthand, John, my job is to make sure that wherever our software shows up that it doesn't hurt people, right? Uh, so what we've done over the last couple of years is put um, a, a governance model in place where we focus on matters associated with oversight, particularly as it relates to uh, AI or trustworthy AI. Um, we focus on the controls necessary for AI, so all of the, the risk management activities mm -hmm. require. We're looking at the global regulatory environment and how that's um, adjusting over time. So we need to obviously make sure that we're compliant based on the countries that we sell in. Uh, we are uh, actively working to build features into our platform so that our customers who inherit our platform or purchase our platform um, will have all of the necessary responsible AI features that they'll need in order to do things like mitigate against bias or govern data, govern models and those sorts of things. So we're actively involved in that activity uh, with our development team. And then uh, the last piece that we focus on is culture, just building a, a, a culturally uh, fluent organization so that folks are able to have conversations about trustworthy AI with a degree of credibility and confidence and also embody what we like to refer to as ethical inquiry in their day-to-day -day activities. It's interesting, you, know, you got words like ethics, AI, innovation. Um, it, it, it feels like this new position that's emerging, the one you're kind of leading, is still early innings by the way, I don't think yeah. the game's even started yet, it's so early on. It's not policy, it's because the innovation's here and because the digital transformation has AI behind it, AI has become a real accelerant for applications. And you mentioned some of the things there. Is it gonna be something that the government can, can grok the speed of the, of the industry? Because the innovation side's so fast, when I hear governance, I hear policy, I, f I hear slow. I hear like mm. glacier speed, kind of slow. And the governments tend not to be that fast in terms of adoption. Um, 
the private sector is, and you see that with cybersecurity, by the way, too. So cyber has more privately led initiatives, mm -hmm. government government involved. What's your take on this? Because the innovation, it's not just policy and mm -hmm. being involved in it, doing basic education. The innovation is a real real issue because it's fast. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's let's unpack that a yeah. bit because I, I love this conversation. You know, I'd, I like to say that AI um, is is it's a socio-technical capability, right? And so, much like any technology, we can argue. And so my job is to sit at this intersection of policy, governance, the actual technology capability itself, and how it intersects with people, right? Um, yeah, governance does slow, slow us. I would argue that taking a beat from time to time is a good idea. How many of us get to drive as fast as our cars will allow us, as an example? We have speed limits for a reason, <laughs> right? And they are to keep us from killing ourselves and other people, right? Um, we can find a number of parallels. And so I, I push back against the notion that fast is always good. Um, you know, I know the popular sentiment, fail fast and all, yeah. <laughs> I never like that term, right. by the way. Yeah. I hate that term. <laughs> right. No one like, hey, I failed today. Yeah, no, one, no one likes failure. <laughs> right. But you learn. You learn. And, and I, I understand the sentiment behind um, not dragging out a failure because yeah. that feels like drudgery and yeah. agony. Yeah. I get that sentiment. However, I think if, if taken to its absolute, one suggests, let me just go fast and break things. And that's not good for anybody, right? And so I, I do think it's okay for us to say the word governance out loud and not mm -hmm. shudder. Now, we all live in a broader society, either in our communities, in our nations, on the globe. Mm -hmm. And as a society, we have to have some operating principles that we all abide by, else we have chaos, right? And granted, you know, we have to push the limits from time to time. Um, that's how you get progress and change. But the notion that innovation has to be, as I said, kind of absolutist yeah. and, and almost um, reckless is, I think, a false notion. Um, I think most innovators that I speak with anyway um, attempt to be as responsible with their innovations as they possibly can. And it's funny, you yeah. mentioned the move fast break stuff. That was the famous Mark Zuckerberg quote, mm -hmm. um, Facebook, which by the way, he walked back and said, move yeah. fast and innovate. Yeah. Um, Cause that really sends the wrong message. And you know, the famous Andy Grove, I thought who had the innovation formula right, had an expression that we use in the cube all the time, let chaos reign, then reign in the chaos. And I think you, you kind of teasing it out with the guardrails and yeah. speed limit conversation. Yeah. There is a formula you can apply to innovation to let it run a little bit. Sure. Watch it. Sure. Reel it in. Yeah. There there are levels of risk that one can anticipate and based on the, that anticipated risk, you can enlarge or uh, mm -hmm. narrow your your guardrails. Um, there are ways to mitigate the the impact, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think in the in the broader social conversation in the public dialogue, sometimes that gets lost, almost as as if um, there's this thinking that you know, innovators don't have an appreciation for nuance. <laughs> I, I think people are highly nuanced, uh, and so that's been my experience anyway. And so you know, one of the things that we're really focused on here at SAS is to make sure that we um, broaden the aperture so that we can deal with some of that nuance. Uh, on a technology basis, on a policy implementation basis, on a you name it. So. Uh, you mentioned the um, aperture. Let, I want to talk about government, mm -hmm. role of government, and the role of open source. Mm -hmm. So two areas that are highly active conversations right now with AI are uh, open source mm -hmm. and global. Global access mm -hmm. to the technology. Is it a U.S. thing? Mm -hmm. um, is AI our Manhattan Project? Or, or is AI going to enable um, freedom and peace uh, around the world. So this, this is a really active conversation. I'd love to get your thoughts. It's still just now forming. You're starting to see people talk about it because AI can be a competitive advantage for a company, but also for a government and or for adversaries with, say, cyber attacks or whatnot. So it's a kind of a broad question, but it's two areas. Open source has been a great developer playground. Mm -hmm. And right now the activity and the enthusiasm is so high 
And yet on the, on the global side, there's still open questions. What does that look like? How do we approach it? What are some of the things that we can do with other nations to share? Yeah. Let me, let me respond to your question this way, John. I think it's important for folks who are listening to this to understand what I mean when I say AI, right? AI to me is not a thing, right? It's not a product. It's a process. It's a life cycle. It is really about the acquisition and aggregation of data, how that data then is used in models that are used for automated decision making, and then how those models get deployed out in the world, how they trigger a decision either as an input to another system mm -hmm. or an input to a human who, makes, who takes an action, right? And so when we think about AI in that regard, then the question that I think you're really leaning on is the AI application, right, and in any given context. So you're right. Um, AI as an application can be used um, in a business setting for competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. We could take those same sorts of automated decision-making capabilities and use them in a military context, right? Um, have, have drones that are automatically triggered based on a certain catalyst, yeah. right? Um, at any stage, in any scenario, whether it be business, yeah. military, healthcare, you name it, we have to have humans involved who are determining process and procedure early on, well before the first line of code is written, so that we have an understanding of how we want to deploy the AI. So it would be a horribly bad idea to say we're just going to create a bunch of AI drones to go yeah. fight wars for us, yeah. right? However, it may be a perfectly fine idea to say I want AI to, I don't know, turn on my coffee maker in the morning. The levels of risk there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also your point about AI is not a product, it's yeah. an input into, into, like you said, life cycle. So yeah. AI can enable something to happen. And That's even right. by the way, you can actually put AIs into drones. So it's, it's not AI, it's AI is an ingredient That's right. into something. The other product is the application, whether it's a, a drone or coffee maker or software. That's right. It's AI enabled. That's right. Yeah, and all too often today, the conversation about AI in, in, in many people's brains is, is large language models. It's ChatGPT. That's, what, yeah, that's yeah. AI. It's yeah. like, well, wait a second. That is a form of AI, but it is not AI it, uh, in totality. Dave Vellante, my cute partner, calls it AI heard around the world. At that moment when, when ChatGPT came out, it kind of mm -hmm. woke up the average person. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's legit because you can see it, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are on a generational shift, and that's a good, good segue into my next question, which is, it's, it's clear that AI matches things like the PC revolution, the web, mm -hmm. internet, and then mobile. These are key inflection points where the applications changed, the user experience changed, hence the user expectations have changed, right? So you're starting to see this AI generation emerging, and it's clear. It's almost as if it's the, uh, the fashion just changed. Oh, my God, everyone's wearing new clothes. Right. It's the AI clothes. So, so it's like it's, it's younger developers are more engaged, but applications are going to look different, and it's general consensus like the web that everything's going to be AI enabled at some level. This is still early innings. I mean, if you, if you believe that to be true, yep. then we're not even starting the game yet. So this is why this conversation around ethics and governance, because what you guys showed at your Explore conference was, if you get governance right, AI scales. Mm -hmm. If you don't get it right, it kind of breaks down yep. because you're not factoring in the data management piece of which feeds the AI. Yeah, this isn't yeah. like a, a nuanced point, but you know, this is still this. This is why this idea of ethical inquiry becomes so important, right? So if, again, you kind of break down where you just went with that. First of all, I think ethically, um, if you can imagine, and so I, I recently started serving with the um, uh, the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth, doing some work for the thirty three small states. So just follow me here for a second. These are nation states oftentimes. Um, we're talking populations in the tens of thousands, not millions, um, that don't have infrastructure to support, say, a data center, that don't have the skills capacity to support building large language models. And so how do those sorts of people participate in a digital economy, right, of the future? Chances are, unless we are very intentional about pulling them in, that they won't, right? <laughs> Um, it's hugely important that the capabilities of being able to derive code by talking
talking as opposed to having to know some, um, you know, know how to write Python, right, is is very necessary to bring folks like them into the digital economy. So ethically speaking, I think this is a huge game changer uh, because what we're effectively doing, as you kind of pointed out, is we're going into a new era of computing. Now, it has its implications. Mm -hmm. I think you know our previous computing experience was one, one more one that was more precision based, mm -hmm. and our new computing experience will be one that's more probabilistic based. And we can get into um, kind of the distinction if you like. Um, but in either case, where governance shows up is um, the consent on the data that is being used to develop the models. Uh, not only how the models are created and, and deployed, but who gets a say in the algorithmic mm -hmm. techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Who gets to determine what we're optimizing for, um, those sorts of things. Yeah. So, yes to it's broadening a set of opportunities for people who might not otherwise have had them. Yes it creates some implications that we all need to be aware of. And yes, we've got to have proper governance and a good understanding for what that truly means. And it, by the way, doesn't just mean the feds are showing up and saying, no, you can, <laughs> yes, you can, yeah. right? But it is, it is about that, as I described, that ethical inquiry that goes into determining access to data, who gets to manage it, how the models are developed, how it gets yeah. deployed, et cetera. I mean, that's a whole nerd conversation around data supply chain, software supply chain, on and on, which are key topics that you guys talk at your, your conferences. On, on the a customer side, Reggie, I want to get your thoughts. You mentioned you know, work, the work you're doing um, and others. The enthusiasm's high. Check. You see that? No problem. That checks the box. Confidence is getting there. That's to me the next transition. We're at the enthusiastic stage. What are some of your customers thinking right now? What are they enthused about most? And where do you see the confidence landing? Um, I mean, it's going to land somewhere, and it's always going to land in probably a, a low-hanging fruit use case. Where, where do the customers go from enthusiastic to I'm in, I'm leaning in, I'm implementing, when where they are confident mm -hmm. in not only just the AI, but the overall AI products yeah. that have been rendered? In my conversations, most of them are confident now um, of being at the stage of exploration and experimentation. They are a little less confident or maybe a little more cautious as it relates to long-term deployment as it relates to their customers being impacted. So there is kind of the internal view of this, which is, you know, I can, I can try to build some things on my own, affect myself. That's one thing, again, lower risk. But when I start going outbound, I have to take, um, uh, is a different risk calculation, if you will. Uh, I was just with some financial services customers uh, two weeks ago, and they're dealing with that very thing. It's like, okay, int you know, internal IT shop, we can use it for maybe some cybersecurity sorts of things. Uh, maybe we can do some, some, some things different as it relates to how we're aggregating data and these sorts of things. But we're going to slow down when it comes to um, products that are going to impact our people, whether they be chatbots, whether they you know, be um, uh, triggering decisions for loan decisions and all those sorts of things, um, and understandably so, right? Particularly, and we should, we should note that a lot of these companies, particularly in financial services, they've been using AI for years, right, in their back offices. Yeah. Um, but now with the generative conversation, there's much more Enthusiasm, I guess, is yeah. the words that's used about how it then can be used yeah. as a as a part of a capability set as they go outbound and touching their customers. Mm -hmm. I think there is a bit of a wait and see around generative, largely because of some of the, the legal dynamics there, as as well as the technical yeah. dynamics with hallucinations and what have you, accuracies and what have you. Um, but the the legal is is really concerning right now um, for most folks, and you know you don't want to build on a foundation, <laughs> they call them foundation models, yeah, right? yeah. you don't want to build on a foundation just to see that foundation yeah. crumble in the next if year. If there's cracks in the foundation, it's not going to be yeah. good. It's, it's funny, you mentioned earlier, uh, um, I didn't say compute, but you said math, computation. Mm -hmm. uh, compute is going to be a big part of the cloud, next-gen cloud, and mm -hmm. and with generative AI, it is generating something, so it's not, it's, uh, there's been actually better AI in the back office, as you mentioned, machine learning, unsupervised, supervised, been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. But the generative AI creates an experience with data. So there's two issues. There's hallucinations, as you mentioned. Yeah. Everyone sees that with chat GPT. It's not perfect. But it's not the, that's not the oracle of knowledge. I mean, it's just, it's just crawling the web. The big trend is 
that with these vector databases and these embeddings, you can actually go into um, with compute and make data work anywhere. So that's going to bring the edge into fact into play. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is companies having um, their own language models. Um, we put out a, a research that showed a power law with the big proprietary LLMs like ChatGPT, OpenAI, mm -hmm. Anthropic, um, AI21 Labs, and others. But there's going to be an evolution of small language models where there's proprietary information. So we see an era where integration is going to happen with data. So here, ethics, trustability, where to come from, and proprietary um, intellectual property from the company mm -hmm. has to work with others. This is going to be a whole nother level. What's your vision on uh, this trend, and how can customers start setting up their practice now to understand that data, their data, will be out there in the wild mm -hmm. and will have to interact with public models? I yeah. mean, clearly APIs will be a big part of that, but this is a whole nother level. Yeah, so there's a, I'll call it a, um, what primarily is a U.S.-centric <laughs> approach and kind of a European approach. I'll just use those two as <laughs> polar opposites right now. Yeah. The U.S.-centric approach has been, um, let's go slow on the regs, let's appreciate where the tech is headed, uh, and then let's use you know, common in case law to build the necessary precedents to to regulate that legally, mm -hmm. right? And then the opposite side, you've got the European view of let's let's put a regulatory regime in place based on what we expect out of the technology in the next 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20 years. I, I want to set that up for my response simply to say, you know, if you really dig into the European stuff, of course the EU AI Act gets a lot of press. But they've got a lot of other acts that dart around that. One, namely, is the Data Act. And, and you know, they've been in, in what they call this digital decade. In Europe, for, you mean? In Europe, Because yeah, yes. they have sovereign clouds and a variety of country interests. Right. Yeah. Now, now, here's the thing, though, right? When you really start digging into it, they realize that, you know, data is the lifeblood of AI. And they also realize that the hyperscalers are all U.S. countries or uh, companies, mm -hmm. right? So think about this. I've got all these citizens with all this data that's now being accumulated in a cloud somewhere <laughs> else, potentially. Of course, they said, no, you know, you got to no, no, we have gotta, a region in the area. Have, yeah, 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 yeah. They but, say that. Yeah, but, but it's really, still a US can this over, there's all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so where, where they take, where they go with the Data Act, ultimately, is they say, well, and this is, this is my language, we want to create some yeah. level of leverage such that our citizens aren't just at the, you know, the, the are, are made vulnerable at the mercy to, of the at the mercy, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so, and so, um, where they're headed, I think, is to create a, a regime where you and I, if we were citizens there, uh, had an op would have an opportunity to participate in the monetization of our data. Yeah. Right. And if we're companies, we need to protect our data. Exactly right. And so, right now, that model doesn't exist. The Literally, the the architecture to support that doesn't exist, but you can almost you can kind of see where the ball is bouncing on that one. Mm -hmm. um, in the U.S., we don't have such a such a plan. I I do think, however, we may end up getting pushed and dragged in that direction ultimately. I mean, the early hearings are pretty much setting up for at least some guardrails around letting the ball bounce between things a little bit faster and looser than Well, I think it's going to come areas. down to this notion of personal data sovereignty uh, at the end of the day. I, I think um, if, if you can imagine an AI optimized world where, you know, uh, maybe you don't have to work as many days during the course of a, a week um, and we can still achieve our growth goals and all the rest of it. Um, how do you pay your mortgage if you're not <laughs> earning mm -hmm. uh, as much as you maybe need to or used to? Well, you've got to be able to participate in the economy in some way, shape, or form. And maybe this personal data sovereignty gives you the ability to do that. Again, we're probably talking easily yeah. a decade or more out before anything like this even starts to hit the pavement. But I do think it's a conversation worth provoking because those who are at greatest harm, those who are most vulnerable today are those who aren't 
participating on the front end of this technology, right? And we've got a lot of people there. And so when people, you know, talk about, you know, you're, you do AI and it's scary and all those sorts of things, I'm like, yeah, the, the doomsday dystopia mm -hmm. conversation, I'm less concerned about. Yeah. What I'm much more concerned about in the short term is one's ability to participate in the economy in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's coming out of AI is, is that it's gonna give the humans more, hopefully, opportunities to be spend more time doing things, whether it's creative or knowledge worker based. When I mean, you start to see AI now, today there's only pretty much three great use cases of AI. Chatbots, some sort of co-pilot mm -hmm. assistant augmenting a human, mm -hmm. and predictive magic are here. Yeah. And that's gonna get better, Sure, that's gonna get better. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, I've been saying on theCUBE, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is that there'll be a new creative class emerging in the tech scene. I mean, it's been, we've always had a creative class, but in technology, mm. how much creativity really have we had in technology? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it can get better, and you bring up this whole societal thing, you know, if IT can become more knob pushing buttons and turning buttons, mm -hmm. that's going to really give more creativity for being a better cybersecurity analyst, yeah. uh, a better uh, application developer, a better worker, mm -hmm. or entrepreneur, start a company. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure what, where my mind goes when you talk about a creative class. You know, I think about... Um, Capabilities like YouTube, yeah. um, capabilities like podcasts, where yeah, it, it unleashed a lot of opportunity for people to be creative in those spaces. But we got a ton of mediocrity, yeah, yeah. right. And so yeah, we're, we'll see a lot of that, and we're starting to see some yeah. already with, with AI. You know, everybody's you know got, <laughs> got their stable diffusion yeah. picks and all this sort of stuff. You know, but um, what, what we'll do, I think, we'll find the creative geniuses that we otherwise would not have found because yeah. they wouldn't have been able to come through the mainstream channels. Yeah. Very much like, you know, you get YouTube superstars yeah. that turn out to yeah. be good actors I or mean, whatever the case AI, may be. AI assisted humans, I mean, AI, we've been saying on the cube, can scale data. Yeah. Well, we have data in our head that can scale intellect. that's intellect. So, you know, I, I view it to the cloud days. I remember when Amazon started, you know, when I was starting a company, you know, I had two choices, spend about $50,000 on gear and co-locate it in some colo, which is more, cost more money, setting it up, provisioning it, or put my credit card down and pushing my code from my laptop to the cloud and getting a prototype up and running. So the friction was reduced. Mm -hmm. I can put something out there, get some funding, boom, I start a company. That's how Dropbox, Airbnb, they all started that way in that generation. I think now with AI, there's more tools for, you know, in the dorm room to the boardroom, there's activity. You'll see a ton of it. You yeah. know, you'll see, you'll see. Cambrian explosion, potentially. Kids who, like like my kid, who is into music, right? And I'm like, yo, you know, go get into the AI <laughs> stuff, right? Because that's where this yeah. thing is headed. And so you'll start to see a lot more creativity in terms of the use of, um, the the raw talent through the use of the tools, right? So I think, and again, this is very much like we saw with you know the last computing, computing uh, um, uh, spark, right? Uh, we saw it with the internet, yeah. right? So I, I think these eras are um, they they tend to repeat uh, in terms of the way we interact. It seems, um, but. In the end, I think what they all do, John, is create a level, I won't say a level playing field entirely, but they certainly begin to level the playing field as you begin to democratize capabilities for more people to participate. Well, I'm excited by AI. I think it generates a skill set that isn't taught much in schools. I think everyone can freely participate and level up if uh, up to the, to the yeah. jobs are needed. My final question for you, Riz, I really appreciate taking the time here in your home studios here. That's why it's gorgeous. Love it here in Cary, North Carolina. Um, Super Cloud 4 is about multiple environments, multi-cloud environments now are going to be global. You got not only multiple clouds, now you're talking about multiple geographies and, and continents mm -hmm. with regions. So you got Amazon, Web Services, Azure, Google Cloud, Oracle, Alibaba. You got all kinds of cloud infrastructures. It's going to provide a challenge for companies. Uh, we call it Super Cloud. But with generative AI, <laughs> how do you think about that? What's your what's your thought process on how to start thinking about the next 20 years, next 10 years for my environment to participate and have that super cloud capability? Because we haven't talked about the edge that's coming. Mm -hmm. You know, the humans with wearables and devices and even, you know, just industrial edge. Mm -hmm. Global, multiple clouds, 
AI powered? I mean, that's going to be, that's a data challenge at the end of the day. It is, and there are probably some people who can speak to that better than I can from a technology standpoint. But, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the, really the need to modularize. You know, we, we've had experiments in the past where we've put all of our tech needs into one bucket. And I won't name any, you know, big companies that happen <laughs> to do big enterprise scale. Matter, but the whole idea here is if you... If you invest all in one bucket, be that one of the hyperscalers or not, um, that creates a single point of failure for you, right? So I think the ability to remain nimble and flexible is, is hugely important for the resilience of any organization. From a technology architecture perspective, I think that means you've got to be able to modularize. If you need to handle um, AI tool sets and disperse those across multiple clouds, That's that's got to be the play. If you've got one solution that's targeted for one geography, okay, great, maybe you just land that all on one cloud. But, you know, I, I think um, understanding the, the gravity of data, mm -hmm. understanding the need to be modular with the technology so that you remain mm -hmm. a nimble, and oh, by the way, don't get locked in on some of the cost yeah. dynamics associated with some of these, is just hugely important. Yeah, and then government's piece is so critical, yeah. making that data you know, more frictionless and sharing. Reggie, thanks for uh, spending the time here in your home studio. My it's pleasure. like a home game for you. Thank you, man. Hey, great, great to see you. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here in Cary, North Carolina at the beautiful SAS Studios for a special presentation. Unpacking, we'll have more conversations about data ethics, data reliability, data governance. This is the key to speeding up the AI in a responsible and scalable way. Thanks for watching.